Good morning, everybody. Uh, today is Thursday, uh, uh, June the 8th, 2006. Uh, we're here to, uh, as part of the uh, Veterans History Project, and it's put on by the Library of Congress, and that is to to, to keep for posterity the men and women that uh, were part of World War II, actually any any part of, of, of the military, but uh, mostly part of World War II. Uh, today we have uh, Harold uh, Shaken, and he was a B-26 uh, pilot, and, uh, and we're really happy to have you aboard here. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna interview from the other side there, okay? All right. Okay, Harold, um, can you uh, uh, can you tell us your name and spell it too, please? Yeah, my name is Harold Shaken, and my last name is S-H-A-K-I-N. My first name is Harold, H-A-R-O-L-D. No middle initial. Okay, okay no middle initial, okay. Uh, uh, let's start out by uh, asking you where you were um, where you were born and brought up? I was born and brought up in New York City, most of the time in the Bronx. And uh, I lived there until I was 18 years of age, finished high school in the Bronx, and then I applied and got into Cornell University on uh, what they call a region scholarship. I went into the agricultural school, and at that time, yeah, the agricultural school had, uh, there was no no money involved. Only thing you had to pay for is uh, is your books and library fees, stuff like that. Okay, now uh, uh, can you tell us where uh, where your where your a uh, little bit about your family? Uh, your father, where did your father come from? Uh, my father he came from Europe. Actually, he served in the First World War. He was a veteran of the First World War, and uh, when he he came to the states. I don't know exactly when, before the war, but he came before the war and then he served in the, in, the, uh, in the army and he was in Europe and then he came back here and he got married to my mother. Okay, how did he meet your mother? And that was in those days, it was an arranged marriage. The old man, he, uh, my grandfather, arranged everything, marriages for all his days. He had three daughters. And he arranged marriages for all three of them. And this was an arranged marriage for my mother uh, to my father at the time. And uh, it didn't last that long. It only lasted around 10 years. About 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, on that marriage, how many brothers and sisters did you have? I had one sister. And then I had another brother quite a while later on uh, when, uh, to uh, my stepfather. Okay. Now... Now, Dottie, you were brought up uh, during the uh, Depression. Can you tell a little bit about that, please? Well, the Depression was an interesting time for us, uh, for me anyway. We were brought up in the Depression. We didn't have too much, but we always had something to eat. We always had a roof over our, over our heads. In those days, uh, uh, my folks actually, at one time, my, fa or my father was a butcher. And he had his own butcher store for a while, and then he was working for other people. Then they got divorced, and my mother married another man, and he uh, was a furrier, where he uh, did uh, a lot of work uh, with uh, mink, mink coats. He made mink coats. And uh, he was an intellectual type of guy. He went to Cooper Union and, uh, for uh, electrical engineering, and he didn't finish up. He got married and didn't finish up. But he was a pretty smart, yeah, a smart guy. And uh, he treated us well as a stepfather, my sister and myself. Did you have any more, did the, uh, your mother have any more children after that? After that, he had one boy, yeah. One boy with him and he, uh, my, my stepbrother, half-brother, he uh, became a doctor. And he's doing pretty well right now. Okay, then you, uh and you, uh, you went to school there in, in the Bronx, you said? Yeah, we went to high school, through all my school, elementary school, and 
and then the high school was in the Bronx, and then I, I graduated from the Evander Childs High School, and uh, I went and applied to Cornell University and got into Cornell Agricultural School, where I majored in plant pathology. And uh, at that time, in 19, 1940, when the war started, when the, when the Pearl Har Harbor started, uh, I remember when Pearl Harbor Day, I came down into town in Ithaca from Cornell and uh, went to the movies. And in the middle of the movies, the lights came on and the manager came up and says, we're at war, the Japanese just attacked us. That's how I found out about Pearl Harbor. And uh, uh, about uh, a couple of months later on, we were uh, all exempt from the draft because we were going to school. And, uh, but they told us that if you join the Air Force, if you volunteer into the Air Force, we let you finish college. And when you finish college, then you, you come into the Air Force. Uh, we figured that's a good, good deal. We wanted to all finish college, and my uh, date to finish was in 1943. That was my class, 1943. And about March of 43, about three months before I was re ready to graduate, um, they said, we need you right now, and they took us out. <laughs> they broke their word. <laughs> and there was actually myself and two buddies that were all together at the time. They, they took us in, in March at that time and sent us down for basic training in Atlantic City. And for one month in Atlantic City, we walked the boardwalk singing, marching, and just waiting to go to the next phase. And we had all our shots there. Um, well, then we had about seven different shots for different diseases, I remember that. And then uh, uh, we were sent to Nashville, Tennessee for, I think, just to get us set up to where we were going to go, either pilot or, or navigate a bombardier or someplace like that, or, or flunk out completely. And because uh, you, ha you had to, uh, your eyes had to be right, and your, your hearing had to be right to be a pilot. If there was anything missing in that time, they you went either to bombardier school or navigator school. And they gave you a test uh, in English, physics, History, uh, what else? There were six subjects we had to take English, physics, history, and three more, so I forget what they are. Anyway, uh, I was deficient in uh, physics and in history. And so they said, well, You're going to have to make that up. And they sent us to Norwich University in Vermont to make up the subjects you were deficient in. And I was there for three months, and uh, then was sent back down, I think it was to, I forget, Montgomery, someplace like where they assigned you to wherever you're going to go training. And I was assigned training in Tennessee, primary training. That's so they, they took you out of school and put you back in school. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, back up a little bit there. Uh, now, when, uh, when you were in school and you know, in college, did you were you involved in sports at all, or were you a sports person? Or no, not really, not really. And uh, during the summertime, when you were in agricultural school, you had to work on a farm. So for three summers, you had to work on a farm every summer. And uh, I'll never forget the first summer when I was taken out to the to work, find a place to work for the summer. There was uh, five of us in the car, and they took us out to the different farms along in Ithaca, in that area there, and that's upstate New York. And uh, they stopped, and a guy called the farmer over, and, and the farmer came over to us, and he looked at all five of us. He sat us, stand us, stood us up in a row, and he felt our muscles, actually. He <laughs> felt all our muscles, and he says, I want him, and that was me. <laughs> I, I, I worked that farm for, for for the summer. Okay. Okay. Now we're back. We're back to your uh, your uh, basic training. You're you are now in uh, cadet now, right? I was a cadet, right? And I went uh, to Tennessee for my primary training in a PT nineteen. Uh, they called it PT nineteen Cornell. And that was the actual name of the airplane, the Cornell. And uh, you didn't start out in the, in the steerman? No, no. 
and they had either the Stearman or, or the PT-19, either one or the other. And I was assigned in Tennessee to this outfit that, that taught us in the, uh, the PT-19. It's a low wing mono, monoplane, open cockpits. And my, uh, my instructor was a big fat guy. I don't know how he fit into that cockpit, to tell you the truth. He sat in the front, I sat in the back, and uh, he was a... <laughs> He was an embalmer by trade. How he always kidded him. Hey, you, know, you, you, get, you bring it, you get these young guys up here, <laughs> and you get them already to be embalmed. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he was a good instructor, and he uh, he taught me everything. And at that time, he, uh, in that airplane, you learned everything, even acrobatics. We did all kinds of acrobatics. And uh, when we finished after three months. We went to the next phase of <coughs> training which with uh, a bigger a bigger airplane, BT-13. And in the BT-13, we learned navigation, night flying. We flew at night, we had missions at night where we had to fly by the old system, the airways, there were no airways, there were just lights. You flew from one light to another. And the lights blinked the Morse code so you know what, 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 where they were. So I remember I flew someplace from Fremont Field in, in Indiana, that's where I was stationed. And I flew someplace between Cincinnati and Indianapolis and back at night. And we learned at night, night flying. And we learned navigation. And we learned some instrument flying at the time also. And when you finished that for three months, you passed that. You went to, we, I was assigned to the uh, twin engine Beechcraft. I, uh, I didn't go to fighter pilots, I became a, a bomber pilot. I was taught uh, on the beach, uh, beach uh, I forget which one it was. It was a twin engine beach. And all well, they were electrical. called, I think of the bad, uh, what you call C-45 beach craft. Uh, that C-45, I think it was, you're right. And uh, I learned I learned everything in, the, in that airplane. I, in fact, I liked that airplane. I enjoyed flying it. And uh, when we finished with that, then we got our wings. Now, did you have a uh, at that time, did you have a ceremony or? We had, uh, when we graduated, you mean, yeah, we had a regular parade and the whole bit. Uh, that was someplace out west. I, it was a hot, it was hot in the summertime. It was in June when we finished and they, they gave us our wings then. Now, did you, uh, did you have a girlfriend at that time or anybody nope. that would come and nope. pin the wings on you? No, nope. nothing like that. <laughs> no, and I was out west all alone. I didn't have any family out there. And uh, when we got our wings, they gave us a month off. So we, I went back east to see the family. And you spent your, spent your month with your family then, yeah, and friends, and right. acquaintances? Yeah, and uh, that's where I met my wife, my first wife. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it, 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 my folks lived up in the... Uh, what they call the uh, Catskill Mountains. I don't know if you know about them. That was a, a community of uh, oh, bungalow colonies. And my folks had a bungalow colony, which they rented out every summer. And that's where I, I spent that for one summer. And I met uh, this w woman who lived in another bungalow colony someplace else. And we got together with, and on a Saturday night dance, I remember. So I met her and uh, we got together and eventually got married. Yeah, you got married uh, uh, why you, before you went overseas and so forth, right? Yeah, right. Okay. I got married. Uh, I, I went, I had to go down to uh, Barksdale Field for training in B-26. I was assigned to B-26 training and I didn't actually get any training at all on the B-26. We went down there, I was assigned to a, uh, a group of uh, a crew and the crew had a, a pilot and five other men. There was a bomber, a bombardier and navigator. There was a radio gunner, a tail gunner, engineer. And actually there was seven of us on the airplane. On that, the old B-26 of the Martin Marauder. Was the one that was built in Baltimore. And uh, that was the one that had no wingspan. And uh, that's the one that uh, General Doolittle uh, flew by himself to show everybody that it could fly, and, and after that, everybody went 
learn how to fly with the thing. But did he do it and they shut down an engine to show he can fly with one engine? Yeah, that's right. I think that's, that's where the story everything, went. Everything, yeah. They did everything with that airplane. It was a good combat airplane, a very good combat airplane. The only thing you had to be careful of is not letting it get below 140 knots, because then she stole out. Because if you kept it flying, it's, there was no problem at all with it. No problem with that airplane. And uh, I remember I got down to uh, Montgomery, Alabama. I said, where Parksdale Field it was. That's where I met my crew. I met my pilot, and he came from B-26 uh, school. And I never flew a B-26, and he, he took me up the uh, first time at night. And they sat me down on the pilot seat, and they said, OK, fly the thing. So I flew it. I never was in it before. But I didn't, they didn't tell me anything about the aircraft, and I was kind of real naive. And when I was ready to land the aircraft, I was coming in for a landing, and I was going to land it like I landed the Beechcraft. With the Beechcraft, you just landed it, and then you flare it out at the bottom, and, and it settled down by itself. With a B-26, nobody told me you had to fly it into the ground. Because if you, if you couldn't flare, I came down with that thing, I was going to flare it out and, and land like I'd land on a beach craft. And they just grabbed everything, pushed throttles forward, and, and they said, well, stop. <laughs> and they showed me what, that, what I was doing wrong. But I never had any training in it. Even uh, after that, I did not have any training. I flew co-pilot most of the time in, in the States for about two months before we went overseas. And at that time, uh, the pilot I was flying with never taught me how to fly. I flew co-pilot the whole time. And the only time I finally flew for a pilot was when we got overseas. After flying, I, I most like I flew a lot of missions, and I flew, all the missions I flew, I flew uh, formation. I was the one to fly the formation. My pilot, the pilot who I was flying with didn't like to fly formation. And I flew formation all the time either from the pilot seat or the co-pilot seat. Now, is that a big transition when you uh, go from co-pilot to uh, pilot? A big yeah, transition it's, it's, for you? It's, it's quite a bit because you, then you have responsibility. I don't know why at that time they didn't let the co-pilot into the briefings before a mission, just the pilot. And uh, I think they made a big mistake in that sense that they didn't check out the co-pilot and make sure he knew how to fly the airplane in case something happened to the pilot, you know? And they didn't do it at the time for some reason. I have no idea why. I guess it was part of the pilot's fault also that they didn't check, that he didn't check out the, the co-pilot the way he's supposed to. But I learned by myself. And then I checked out, I got my, uh, checked out on the B-26, the uh, group commander took me up one day and he says, let me, let me see if you can fly this thing. And just me and him, he was standing on the, uh, on the open side uh, of the airplane and just standing there looking out and he said, you fly it, take it around a couple of times and land it. And I did that. And he said, you got it. And that was it. It was, uh, he was a really, a real, real good group commander. Were they, um, could you feel that there were, there were really needed pilots over there that they're kind of pushing you to get you overseas? You know, they pushed us out. We became pilots. We they went. We went to. Uh, I went to uh, Boxdale Field and we became a you know, part of a crew. And then we went overseas, and we went to England first. And we sat in England for six weeks doing nothing. Just sat there in a place called Stone England and just went down to the pub every night and didn't do a thing for six weeks. I mean, there's no flight time? Nothing. Nothing at all. And then they shipped us to, in the middle of the Battle of the Bulge, they shipped us into the area where the, they were fighting, and that's where the, uh, the, uh, that's the where my group was, actually, the, the uh, 323rd Bomb Group, the B-26. There was a 322, which was the first bomb group on B-26s, and then there was a 323rd, which I went to, and we it was right in the middle of the Battle of the Bulge in the field there. I remember we came there uh, uh, with a big uh, semi, 
and we got off and the snow was a foot deep in the forest and they sh w had to walk through the snow into where the tents were. And we lived in a tent, they signed me a tent and no bathroom, there were slit trenches neck you know, off on the side and what you had to use it in the middle of that winter was cold. <laughs> Now, the, your forward base, your your field, what was your field at, your forward base field? It was, uh, it was uh, not too far from the German border in Belgium, not too far from Belgium. Do you I remember actually, the name of it? Yeah, well, they actually, the town there was called La Valenciennes, and it wasn't too far from Mons, Belgium, not too far from Paris, and uh, it was in a factory town, because I remember when we took off, usually to go on missions, we had to fly between two big factory, two big chimneys, and we flew in, right in between them to get, that's where the uh, runway pointed. And okay, now what was your first combat mission when you went to Europe? I forget the name of the town, we, the first combat mission, uh, we, the B-26s had no oxygen, we didn't have any oxygen, and we flew our missions between 14 and 17,000 feet. That's prohibitive, wasn't it? No, no, we didn't go with us at all. We flew for four or five hours without oxygen at around 16,000 feet every mission. And I flew 29 missions like that. And it never seemed to bother us. A bunch of young guy kids, you know. We flew five to six, sometimes seven hours even at that altitude. And then what was your targets mostly? Uh, mostly uh, troop concentrations marshalling yards, railroad marshalling yards, uh, bridges, and sometimes a, a town, a town something that was, that they, we had a bomb. Were your bombardiers very accurate? Well, we actually, the bombing was done, uh, we flew six ship formation, and you bombed on on the lead ship when he, when he let the bombs go. All six ships let the bombs go. And the lead uh, bombardier navigator was in the lead ship. He was the one that used the Northern bomb site to make sure to get you know the target. And the, the, the bombardier navigator that I had, he also used the Northern bomb site just to make sure that he was doing it right. Okay. Now, did you ever uh, do any low air support? No. L low air support. You never did low no. air support. No, 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 no. You left that to the Thunderbolts, huh? No, no. <laughs> In fact, the uh, most of our missions was flak was a thing that was bothering us because we always had some flak. Uh, the first mission I flew, I think we had around 40 holes in the ship uh, from flak. Nothing terribly happened, and it just there was a lot of uh, a lot of holes in the airplane when we landed. They had to do a lot of fixing. The second mission I flew, with they also was a lot of flak and. Uh, knocked out our uh, hydraulic system. So we came down, we didn't have any brakes or flaps or stuff like that. And, uh, took a lot of runway, huh? Uh, took a lot of runway, and uh, that was a really a funny thing that had happened. I, I was flying co-pilot at that time, and then we came down without any hydraulics. We had no flaps, and the, the B-26 is a hot airplane. You had to land it at 140 knots, not below. You had to come down fast. And we didn't have that much runway. We came down, and the pilot was pretty good. He landed right at the edge of the runway, and we were going along 140 knots and slowing slowly. And we couldn't really slow. We were coming towards the end of the runway. And the pilot told me, he says, up, up on your left top, there are two two uh, buttons or two uh, two uh, handles up there. Grab the back one, pull it, and that'll give us our emergency air brakes. I reached back up there. And I felt something back there, and I pulled it. There was no emergency air brakes. Everybody started to laugh up the tower. <laughs> what I did was I pulled the emergency parachute that knocked that pulled out the the uh, life raft as if we were. <laughs> And it pulled out the life raft to like in in the water. <laughs> and uh, it was something that they, they did you ever find did you ever find the the, uh, the handle for the emergency yeah. brakes? Never found it. <laughs> it was up there someplace. I never found it. He just hit the he just held the brakes down then, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And we rolled off the end of the runway into some mud and stuff. That's it. That was the end of that one. Yeah. 
almost all the missions that I flew, there was uh, a lot of uh, flak, because we were always in the middle of, of uh, some big town or something. I know when we always had to fly, when I flew over to Germany, we had to fly between Koblenz and Cologne. They were about 10 miles apart, and we had to get right in the middle, so the flak from e either town couldn't get at us too much. If you were actually one way or the other way too much, uh, you were hit by a lot of flak. The yeah. last mission I flew, right before the end of the war, about a week before the end of the war, uh, we, I saw a funny thing. I, I looked down as flying pilot, I looked down and I saw an airplane zooming past us without any propeller. And I said, what are they sending up the gliders after us? What is going on down there? And that was the first time I saw an ME-262 in the German jet. And they had the German uh, the, the jets, uh, one jet on each flight. And I know my tail gunner was uh, going crazy back there shooting and, and uh, we were flying formation as close as possible. I, I had my wing overlapping and the, guy, the, other, the other guy's wing about a foot above and overlapping, and that we had to get close together and had a lot of firepower. And my tail gunner uh, got too excited. I think he burnt out his guns. Yeah, he kept firing him instead of letting them cool off a little bit. Yeah, there's a, quite a big story in the, that we see there on the, the V-26 versus uh, the 262s. <laughs> it's yeah, in the, in yeah. the uh, internet. Yeah, well, that was the only time I saw a German jet. Okay, minute. now, Okay, Baston is over with now. You're uh, now you're headed for Germany now. You make your missions over Germany. Oh yeah. From forward bases, right? Yeah. Yeah, that one base that was all Valencia and the town we in. We flew all our, our missions out of there, all our combat missions. There was no 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 more from England. Then. They're all no, no, forward bases. No, no, it was all in it was all in, in France. The B twenty sixes were all in France. The early in the war. They flew out of England, but once they got France, they conquered France, reconquered France, and they, they set up in France. And you got you got to uh, to Europe after D-Day then. Oh yeah, I got after the I got to Europe in uh, November November of forty four. Yeah, November forty four. And then uh, then you couldn't get into Bastogne because of the weather for a while, that's, right? That's right. They finally broke, then you guys went in. Yeah, yeah. We started flying, actually we started flying in, in December of 44, which I think we flew our first mission. By that time, the, the, did you get involved in the German retreat, knocking out their tanks? No, we didn't do that at all. No, we were like like in the middle of the Battle of the Bulge. We were sitting right in the forest with the Battle of the Bulge, and then we had to be careful that, that we didn't see any Germans then at the time. They were, they were dressed up in American uniforms, some of them, so you had to be very careful. And uh, Were you told about that? Oh, yeah. Briefed, briefed to that about that, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. Once the Battle of the Bulge was over, then we just flew out of... Uh, that air, that airport for the whole war. We didn't we didn't move after that. When the war was over, then we started to move. Okay, now the war is coming to an end. And talking amongst you, did you you guys knew that the war was coming to an end? Yeah, right? we knew it was coming to an end, and we knew when the, we the last mission, and we were there. And they started. To, we flew. We started to fly every week a little bit. We were training to go to Japan. The, the plan was to send us to Japan. Even though the war wasn't over. Yeah. We were training, ready to go to Japan, uh, wherever on the on the west coast, someplace. And uh, when the, the knock on you know, Japan fell, then we were just waiting to go home. Then. Okay, now you're still in Europe, and, and, and where were you when you heard that? Uh, you know, when was it? Uh, it was the eighth of uh, it was the eighth of May, wasn't it? That when the, when the war was. I think so, yeah. yeah. And where were you then? Were you so we were still there in the same place. In fact, that the last uh, the mission we flew, we were short on uh, aviation fuel. We were really short on gas. That was the time we were hit by the German jets and uh, flying that tight formation, we used up extra gas. And uh, we decided that we, 
might not make it back to the base. So we landed at Metz, France. So he diverted to Metz and we landed there. And that was a short runway there, it was only 3,000 feet. But uh, made it no problem. And uh, we spent the night there, refueled, and then we came back to the base and the war was over. Okay, and then now the war is over now. And um, what was the first thing, of course, that came into your mind now that the war is over? You were already prepped for Japan then, huh? Yeah, we were ready to go. And we flew some missions, and not missions, but we flew some, oh, I don't know what you would call it. I know we flew over Paris around the Eiffel Tower a few times. We circled the whole group of B-26s. That was when de Gaulle came back into Paris. And they made a big festival best of type, type of it, and they, we want, they wanted us to fly a formation over Paris around the Eiffel Tower, and that's what we did. It was a terrible day, a terrible day because it was clear, and it was bumpy as hell. You couldn't keep the airplane steady. We had a formation flying with You, you weren't wingtip to wingtip at yeah, that yeah, one. It was, yeah. <laughs> right, it was terrible. <laughs> now, did you get any liberty, uh, did, did you get any liberty over there, you know, Navy expression, okay, but did you get any time off, or well, did you yeah, go into we town? Flying, and? While we were flying missions, yes. So we had uh, the crew took a week off. We went to London for a week. Yeah, and we spent a week in London as R and R, and then uh, we came back. That was the only time that we really had off. Otherwise, uh, if we had weren't flying for a couple of days, we could get into Paris because it was only about an hour away, and we can get into Brussels. You know, if we at that time we weren't flying, and the weather was bad. Sometimes the weather was bad; we couldn't fly, and so we took a trip into usually Mons, Belgium, or, or Brussels, and every once in a while into Paris. Now, did they let you use your planes for for your uh, time off to, nope. to, to go? You had to use a train or something, huh? Right. What we did was uh, hitch rides onto uh, weapon carriers that were uh, carrying stuff into Paris for some place. Uh, get in, get on one of the uh, jeeps or weapon carriers, something. Somebody was going to Brussels or to Paris. We hitch a ride with those guys. Now, did you have uh, during this time? The, the, there's a. The, I read some good stuff about the mail service from you know your your wife. Did you yeah. get mail, regular mail? Yeah, we got the regular mail. There's no problem. That came in. That was no problem. We got our mail. Do you get any packages, cookies, or things like that? Oh, yeah, that came in. And you know, as an officer over there, you're, you've got, each officer got four bottles of whiskey every month. You got a bottle of scotch, a bottle of rye, a bottle of brandy, and a bottle of rum. Every month you got four bottles. And what I didn't know that. Them, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just the officers. Then, well, we, I usually share it with the enlisted men, you know, of the crew. Okay, now the war is over in Europe, and uh, you're, they're, they've given you orders. Now, they have given you orders now to, to ship out. Did you ship out as a cruise, or did you no, put that on as individual? Individual. They broke us up. Once the, war was, once the war was over in Japan, then everything went to hell. They, we, they, they just... Uh, uh, broke us all up, and depending on how many points you have to get home. I, I know they, uh, I had like, I don't, know how they, I don't know how they figured points, depending on how much time you spent in Europe. I had like 75 points, and my time to get home wasn't until Jan January of 45, or 46 rather, January of 46. That's when I was scheduled to go back. Yeah, I guess they, they had the point system was in missions and yeah, age. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now you're you you okay now you're headed back. You, you, what, do you remember what ship you were on, or you took, where'd you take the ship from? No, I took the ship from uh, France, Calais, or something. It was a big uh, troop ship. It wasn't uh, it was just a regular troop ship, and it took us eight days to get across. I remember that. Kind of slow, isn't it? Yeah. Getting to uh, Europe, uh, they put us on the Queen Elizabeth. And uh, it took all, Queen Elizabeth went over all by itself, no escorts, nothing. 
and then like every 20 seconds it made an evasive turn. So it was going like this the whole way across, you know, for submarines. And uh, I remember the first day there, I was, I was okay, but the second day I got terribly seasick because of the ship, the way the ship was going. I, even though it was the Queen Elizabeth, they had like over, over 20,000 people on board. Everybody, everybody was on board. They had all kinds of people on board. And in three and a half days, we were in England. But after the second day, I was okay. And it was funny, it was an English ship now. The officers were assigned to a stateroom. There were four officers in a stateroom. And we had our own, uh, what do they call it? Oh. They assigned you uh, um, a man to take care of you. They made your beds. This guy made, an English guy, part of the crew of the ship. He made your beds, straightened up your room, made sure everything was okay every day. And that's the way they treated officers. They treated them great. That's great. Okay, and then now, how did it feel to pull into New York Harbor? Well, I, you know, I, I got in Fort Dix, as that's where I was separated in Fort Dix. I never got a discharge paper. As an officer, he was separated. He never got discharge papers. And uh, I said, go ahead, you're on your own now. Go. And I, I know before I went, they had to do some medical work on me. I don't know just what, something was wrong with my larynx, and I had it. I think I was in, a, in the hospital for a couple of days. I had some kind of small operation. And uh, uh, then I, when that was finished, and I, uh, I just, from Fort Dix, I went back to New York City and walked home from the from the subway station. You were discharged. Walked, this uh, that was it. Did you, have, did you have your little ruptured duct? Yeah, I had that. I had the whole bit, but uh, never had any real discharge papers, separation papers they called it. In case they wanted you, they could pick you up any time. Okay, now you're you're separated. You're on the way home. And, and did, your, did your wife know that you were in the vicinity coming home, or? No, she didn't know. I came home, I walked home with just one bag, and I, I, I she lived in Brooklyn at the time, and I went to Brooklyn. I was never, I was never in Brooklyn. And I, that's where I met my, my wife and her family, first time, in Brooklyn. And that was the end of it. Did you walk in there and knock on the door? And that's as far I remember walking with her with a, my suitcase, I don't remember actually getting into the house. But that's what happened there. Okay, now you're, you're home now. Well, what was your, did you start making plans and yeah, get the I home was, and? Yeah, I was making plans. I was, I thought maybe I'd go back and get my master's degree and, uh, cause I had my uh, bachelor's degree. I got enough points from, from the service of the officer's training I had enough, uh, I needed around 20, 20 points to finish my, my uh, bachelor's degree and then I had, to, I had over 20 points from the, uh, from, the, uh, from, the, uh, from the Army Air Force. And so I had my uh, bachelor's degree and I thought I'd go for a master's in, this, in the subject I was studying at the time, uh, plant pathology. So I went up to Cornell with my wife and uh, she was a real city girl and she couldn't take that type of living. So, I was a jerk. Actually, I should have I should have stayed and, and, and did what I wanted, but I, I gave in to her, and we went back to Brooklyn and went into business there. And I was never really that happy about the whole thing. Okay, what, what, uh, what kind of business did you go into? Well, I went into a liquor store. I, uh, I had money and uh, my in-laws uh, gave me some other money and we bought, bought, I bought a liquor store. And we had the liquor store for about mm, about seven years and I sold it. And then I just wandered around, didn't do too much, was in the paint business. Mm -hmm. Paint. Yeah, and uh, it was in that for about, oh, I about oh, a year, I think. And then I decided I this type of business, I'm not a businessman, it's not for me. And I said, somebody told me, why don't you try uh, the, uh, the government work and uh, as an air traffic controller? I said, what's that? And they said, well, you know, you, you control airplanes. 
And I said, okay, so I, I went down and I signed up as an air traffic controller and I went for training uh, to Oklahoma City for three months and then they shipped me to Idlewild, which is the now Kennedy Airport, Airport you know, in, in New York City. And I uh, became a, a trainee in the en route facility. That, that's a facility where they, there's 21 en route facilities in the United States and New York was one of them. And this is where you controlled all traffic 5,000 feet and above, so called. So uh, I became an en route controller after a while. And I uh, trained and became, passed all the tests that I needed for as a controller. And I was an old man. I was 40 years old when I started training as an air traffic controller. Today, I don't think they hire you unless you're below 37 or something like that. How did you do that, uh, Harold? I did that, I did that for 23 years. Air traffic control in uh, New York. And the last six years, I was teaching it. I, I was teaching uh, where they had the uh, people, where they had to pick up all kinds of people, you know, what do they call it? Um, Inter integrate? Yeah. They had a, 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 one out of every four had to be minority type of person and they, they drag people off the streets from Newark and all kinds of places and, and put them in training and I was uh, what they call a GS5 training I taught them English I taught them how to speak I taught them uh, uh, just do basic air traffic control and it's I had to teach them some math because there's some math involved and uh, that lasted for six months, that type of training. And I had a couple of cat classes that way that I taught. And then uh, after that, I was teaching actually air traffic control too. When I first became an air traffic controller, there was no radar. And when you controlled airplanes, it was all in your head. You had to have the picture of the map in your head and you spoke to the pilots and you asked them, report over this fix and estimate your time over the next fix and give us your altitude. And we controlled them that way. And you had the little slots. That you yeah, the things on the, on the board in front of you where you had marked down everything on a, on a little slip of paper. The radar came in uh, about 1967, 68. We used to get, we got basic radar. Well, we could follow a target, little blips, you know. And we had a little plastic thing. You mark the airplane identification on the plastic, little plastic thing, and you push the plastic thing along following the little blip the airplane. And uh, once the radar came in, it became much easier. Before that, when you had to do everything in your head, you could work maybe 12 to 15 aircraft, you can work at one time, you know, control 12 or 15 in your head and keep them separated. After 15, it became too busy, you, you just couldn't do it. And I was like an old man now, this is a young man's job. And I was in my 40s and uh, I was able to do it for a good long while, for at least 10 years until the radar came in. When the radar came in, it became much easier. Then you can see, you can see what you were doing then. Did you get any training on your radar? Oh yeah, you had to train for radar. When radar came in, you became a radar controller. And then in New York uh, Center at the time, you became a radar controller, you can go, you get up to a GS-14. Is that how, what you went to? Yeah, when I retired, I was a GS-14 at the time. Okay, you, you retired as a uh, air controller, yeah, wow. Yeah. Now, have you, there's a good question here for you. Have you been up to, lately, seen what, how far they've gone? Uh, it's altogether different now, I, not lately. I was, uh, well, the last time we were in New York, I went up to the center to see that I knew anybody there. They were all <laughs> gone, all the guys were all gone. And, but it's also going to do it as much more uh, specialization now. Where I used to work on like an area that encompassed Pennsylvania and New Jersey and Maryland and parts of New York and Connecticut, today the guys just work a couple of airways, that's all they work, a couple of airways and that's it. And so and you can see everything on radar, everything depicted for you, it's really, compared to what the old controllers did, it's easy. But they still, they still a lot of burnout too on these the yeah, people. If they yeah. didn't have the proper, you know. Oh your, yeah, there is because you you can get busy. You you can make a mistake. You make a mistake. You know, it's, that's not not right. 
I know uh, the one terrible thing that happened when I, we were working without the radar, a buddy of mine, who we lived, lived next door to each other, he was working uh, uh, traffic from Boston to New York, and he was uh, over like in New York, he was controlling traffic on the airway that went from Boston to New York. And he was working at Trans World and an Eastern at the time. They were in opposite directions on this one airway. And one was supposed to be at 11,000 feet and one was supposed to be at 10. And uh, the pilots at the time didn't like to fly into the cloud where it got bumpy. For some reason, the guy at 10,000 went up to 10.5, and the guy at 11 came down to 10.5, <laughs> and they actually hit. That was the accident that happened over Staten Island where they went in. One went into Brooklyn. I think one went into Staten Island. And everybody was everybody was killed. The two airplanes. And, what year uh, was that? That was back in the 60s. 60. 60 been around the 65. Do you remember the uh, Ricker Island uh, crash? No. But the DC-6 that went into Ricker Island, uh, the, the prison, no. it was winter time. No. No. Yeah, I guess, uh, did you have any, uh, see other things like that while you were the controller? Close calls? No, close calls, I, not really. You're not supposed to have close calls. Everything's supposed to be separated. And. Uh, if you have a close call, you have to put two airplanes together, and uh, you had to keep had to keep them five miles apart, unless they're at different altitudes. Same altitude was five miles, and this is without radar. Crossing is five miles. If in route uh, in trail is ten miles, there was a lot of things that you had to remember and do right. Once the radar came in, then it was much much more. And weather had a lot to do with it, didn't it, over there? Oh yeah. Well, that's where you know the guys are burnt out quickly because if you didn't have, when we didn't have radar, if the weather got bad, you know you're going to be busy. You know you're going to be busy. And I know I worked a lot of times. I worked traffic out of Philadelphia, one of our areas. Where you work out of, out of departures out of Philadelphia and inbounds landing Philadelphia, coming over from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, all the way into the airport in Philadelphia. And you had to work the inbounds, and you worked the outbounds, and the crossing traffic. This was all without radar, and uh, it was exciting. It really was. If it, unless I got too busy, if I got too busy, it was. Busy. Now, what happens? What happens if if you're let's suppose you're at uh, uh, out a while, and weather just closed in, you can't land there. What do you tell the, the, the guy up there that's running out of gas? What do you well, say to him? Well, if he's him? running out of gas, then he's a, he has a problem. Then he's deferred it to another airport. Another airport. And, and he, can, he goes to the like, Good luck, huh? Yeah, he can go to Boston or wherever he wanted to go, depending on how much gas he had left. But usually, if his weather got bad, they had enough gas to hold for a while, so he put him in a holding stack. The high altitude stuff, the holding stack could go from 18,000 feet and above, 1,000 feet one after another. And just you hold them in a stack. Okay, then then you uh, okay, uh, I've neglected a couple of things here now. Uh, do you have any children? Yeah. I had uh, two girls my first marriage and then I had a boy with my second marriage. And they're all doing very well. You know, do they live around here, or where do no, they live? my boy lives in, in Denver. He lived in uh, Silicon Valley for a while until that went bust. Then he got himself a good job in Denver, so he moved to Denver. And uh, he's doing very well. My daughter, the oldest daughter, is uh, she was head of uh, the uh, computer department in, uh, in the medical field of... Uh, Pediatric board. The pediatric board, and she was the head of the computer. She took care of all the computers there. And the uh, younger daughter became uh, CEO and Planned Parenthood on the East Coast. So she's doing all right also. 
Okay, then, then you, of course, you you have some grandchildren? And yeah, I got uh, one daughter, I have two, and my other daughter has two, and my son has one. Have a grand, great grandkids? No, not yet. Uh, okay. Not yet. Well, listen, uh, also, okay, then, uh, you, when did you move to Palm Springs? Well, we moved out of New York uh, in 1980, and we moved to Thousand Oaks in California, there near north of uh, L.A., and we lived there for about seven, eight years, and we decided to move to Palm Springs, and we came here uh, uh, just about 20 years ago, in uh, 87, I think we moved here. Uh-huh. Yeah. We and, moved, and, moved uh, and how about the museum? When did you hear about the new museum? Oh, with the museum, I heard about it through Larry, and uh, I joined around three years ago. Okay, well, listen, it's really a pleasure to have you. And uh, one last thing, uh, how, how do you like restoration? Does that you fit in uh, real good there? Oh, yeah, it's very good. You got very a great good. group there, crew oh, there. Yeah, yeah, a nice bunch of nice guys. Everybody helps each other out. That's great. Okay, well, listen. It was really great to interview you, and uh, and you, you had a quite quite a career there. Okay, thanks again, uh, Harold. You're quite welcome.